Today we're going to be talking about Smart Grid, the Pecan Street project, and how that's going to affect your business over the next three days to ten years. So let's move right on to introductions for our uh, speakers today. Most of you know Brewster McCracken. Uh, Brewster is the executive director of Pecan Street Incorporated. And that's a smart grid research and development organization headquartered at UT, probably best known for the work they're doing at Miller, but that's not all that they're doing. Um, Brewster is the uh, co-author of a white paper that will be coming out soon, Why the Clean Energy Economy is Underperforming, and he was the lead author of Pecan Street's successful smart grid stimulus application in 2009. The, uh, that received the ERA grant that is making most of the work that they're doing now possible. Um, Brewster served two terms on the city council, the Austin City Council. Uh, he served as, and in that position, he served as a board member for Austin Energy. Uh, and he founded and chaired the city council's Emerging Technologies Committee and led the city, city's collaboration with UT to establish technology incubators in bioscience and wireless technologies. Prior to being elected to city council, Brewster practiced commercial litigation for almost 10 years with two large international law firms, and he has honors degrees from University of Texas School of Law and Princeton. Brewster also has a master's in public affairs from the LBJ School. Jeff Ibihara is vice president of sales and marketing for Concert. Uh, Concert um, Jeff leads Concert's national sales force in, force in the coordination and execution of their smart grid pilot and commercial programs with some of the biggest generating distribution utilities in the United States, and we also expect to be working with them here at Austin Energy over the next few years. Um, Jeff has, uh, in addition to his entrepreneurial work, Jeff has, been, has worked in the public sector uh, for the city of, well, for a couple of cities. Um, he was a clerk of Park Township, Michigan, and reelected as trustee in 2008. And he served as a management assistant, the city manager of Dallas, and was budget director for the city of Sunrise, Florida. Jeff holds a BA from Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio, and an MPP from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Barry McConaughey. McConaughey is the founder and CEO of Insynergy. Insynergy is a local smart grid software company that makes advanced energy management systems to create smart buildings. Insynergy's energy modeling technology is also the data collection energy behind the Pecan Street project or the Pecan Street initiatives. Barry has 25 years of business development experience building and managing software, energy and communications companies. Um, as founder and CEO, Barry led Multimedia Development Corporation to become an internet infrastructure systems industry leader. And then he turned his attention to trying to mitigate uh, climate change. And that was when he founded Global Climate Strategies. And now he's with Insynergy. Barry's married and has three children and has a carbon neutral commute in a very cool plug-in electric vehicle. He can tell you what it is, but it's a really cool one. So let's go ahead and get started with Brewster. Uh, we're going to have kind of a handoff here. We only have one microphone that's connected to the video, so it's, it'll take a second. If I can get myself on. We uh, announced this morning, like Richard said, that all of us working together 
and with our volunteer participants in the Miller community, are going to have 100 residents who have uh, Chevy Volts within a one square mile area starting next June. That's as near as we can tell. That's the that'll be the densest concentration of, of people who have a re residential ownership and operation of electric vehicles in the United States. And that's uh, that's that's a great challenge for Austin Energy, who's hosting all this research from all these companies. Uh, the uh, one of the things we're also doing as part of that is Sun Edison, one of the big solar manufacturers, is uh, going to lead the work with Chevrolet and Freescale and the other members of our consortium on using rooftop solar panels to charge electric cars that the folks have in their garages. Uh, and then uh, we uh, have home energy and kind of home management platforms that are going to be deployed by Sony, another group by Intel, uh, another group by Whirlpool and another group by Best Buy uh, with a home alarm automation company named Check It working with Best Buy. And then uh, Whirlpool is going to provide smart appliances for some of the participants in our research. Uh, all the way around we're using in synergy equipment to uh, capture what has turned out to be the uh, nation's and maybe the world's most granular uh, data on how people are using electricity. Uh, we're capturing six circuits in the whole home in 15 second increments. It's such sensitive amount of data, it's such a sensitive data collection system that it can, when, it can capture when the refrigerator doors open by the change in energy usage. Uh, we're capturing 15 second data on gas and 15 second data on water usage. Uh, this is the first time to our knowledge uh, that anywhere in the world has there been an effort to find out how people are using electricity, gas, and water uh, during the course of a day in their homes. Apparently they tried this out with two robots in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, someone told us that. We're like, why are you telling us that? Yeah. But, um, the, uh, but, but I want to tell you why we're doing this, because we actually have a strategy behind why we're doing this. And it, and it gets into something we write about, which is why we have concluded that the clean energy economy is underperforming, you know, because it is. Uh, but uh, that doesn't change the fact that there have been some really impressive technology advances, uh, particularly in uh, automotive technologies, photovoltaic, uh, uh, particularly in the conversion and in, uh, in, um, in batteries. So understanding how things become economically successful, uh, it turns out that as a general matter in all of economics, that's pretty well understood. And so the key thing is to not try to ignore the laws of economics as we try to uh, create improvements in customer value and improvements in electricity management and improvements uh, in, the, in, uh, in carbon reduction in the environment. So we'll get to this. I mean, I'm not sure, are we, do we do this? Okay, <laughs> thanks Richard. So there's three, there's three ways that technology's entered the market. Uh, one way is, okay, is a sustaining innovation and that's uh, within the existing market and delivery structure. That's a new technology. So an example would be, like, let's take the Boeing 787. It's probably the most advanced passenger jet that the world has ever seen. It's called the Dreamliner. It uh, flies further on less jet fuel uh, per passenger than any plane in the world by far. It, uh, the windows auto tint with sunlight, which actually helps keep the plane cool and make people more comfortable. The overhead baggage compartments are far bigger. Uh, all the way around, is, it is a more profitable plane for airlines to fly, and it's a, um, uh, you know, it's really a marvel of technology. It lands at the same air, uh, it lands at the same runways as other planes. It parks at the same gates. Uh, the air, you know, you not airlines like British Air and United Airlines and, you know, and uh, Delta. They're the ones who own the Boeing Dreamliners. In other words. It is a plane that is a great new product, but it is entering into an existing industry and it just it kind of fits in as substitutes. In other words, that uh, uh, United might say, we'll get a Boeing 787 instead of a Boeing 737. So it's a substitute for an existing product. That, that's what makes it sustaining. In the same way, a plasma TV or uh, you know, an L LCD TV, you know, much better picture. Uh, they are, they're thinner, you can put them on the wall but they show the same TV shows, the same cable jack from the wall plugs into it. People who buy them are people who already own a television typically. So in other words, it's just a better television 
but it's, it's, it's the same customers, same shows, and so it's a sustaining innovation. A second way that technology is in the market is, is, is called regulatory fiat, and that's about basically when the government makes you do it, or an insurance company makes you do it. Uh, examples are smoke alarms, um, uh, the most famous one. Smoke alarms as an industry came along because uh, governments and building codes uh, and insurance uh, company providers required a lot of times, say, so you have to have a smoke alarm uh, if you want to get insurance. So, that, so it was something that would enter the market because it was a specific product requirement. A newer example is corn-based ethanol, uh, and, and there, that's been pretty problematic, as we'll visit about a little bit more. Third way that technologies enter the market is, is disruptive innovations. So these are new customers who did not previously own a product or uh, that does this job or a new consumption place or occasion. So uh, let's talk about one of these examples, uh, transistor radio. Anybody know where the transistor in its modern form is invented? Yeah, Bell Labs, AT&T. Uh, and uh, the first place that companies decided would be in, it was pretty obvious, is in televisions. Uh, but it turned out that kind of like, you know, how laptop computers for a long time didn't work as well as desktops. And so you, know, you bought it for a different reason. But you didn't buy it because you could run the programs of the same uh, strength of processor speed or anything like that. So, uh, so RCA and Victor and Zenith and those companies, they all understood what the transistor meant in terms of better picture, potentially, and uh, in, in, in all the way around a better uh, technology than the vacuum tubes. But they just couldn't get it to work very well in the, in the same way that if you try to use a laptop early on to do the job that a big desktop computer could have done. So uh, then uh, Sony had the idea. They said, well, um, let's take this transistor, which isn't able to do very much, although we think it's going to grow into being able to do something that could do a lot. And let's, let's, do, let's uh, put it into radios. See, back then, radios, just like TVs, were big set-top boxes in the living room. So that meant that uh, if you were a teenager uh, in, in the 1950s and you wanted to listen to Elvis Presley or Little Richard uh, guess, uh, or Chuck Berry, guess where you had to listen to him? In the living room, <laughs> next to your parents, right? So Sony came up with this crummy little radio with crummy sound uh, run on a transistor. And you know what? They marketed it to teenagers, and they said, you can listen to music anywhere you want to. And so if you were a teenager, you said, listen to music next to my parents' living room, hear it off a of great sound, or take the radio, go to a party with my friends, and listen to whatever I want to listen to. It was not even a close call, right? They sold more transistors than they could get their hands on. Every teenager that bought a transistor radio from Sony in the 50s, that was probably the first radio they'd ever bought. Uh, so in other words, new customers listening to music in new places. They could listen to it anywhere, and they didn't previously own radios. And then Sony took that transistor, they got a little bit better with it, and they, turned it, they, they started using it in a black and white TV. RCA and Victor and Zena said, man, we're making the big set-top color TVs. A crummy little black and white TV is not a threat to us. And then Sony got the transistor a little bit better, and they made it into a thinner TV that was just it's the same size picture as the RCAs and the Zeniths, but it was thinner. Uh, the picture was actually better, and it was cost competitive. And at that point, RCA and Victor and Zenith and those guys said, oh, man, we got to learn how to use it to make a TV with a transistor in it, and it was too late because they didn't know how to do it, and Sony had a decade head start on them on how to use a transistor. That's what a disruptive innovation is. You kind of go in for new customers and new places to do something, and you get better at it every time you're able to increase the performance. So another example is photocopiers, right? Xerox made big industrial copiers that could make 1,000 copies an hour or something like that. And so Kodak and IBM went toe-to-toe -to, -toe to knock Xerox off, and Xerox effortlessly beat them back. And then Sh Canon and Sharp came out with crummy little copiers that only made a page every minute. But you know what? If you had a two-person small business, you could put it on your desk. And so if, 
And so if you're a small business, you didn't need the big industrial copier. Having a little copier that was cheaper and didn't work as well was still awesome. And so over time, just like the transistor, Canon and Sharp and Fujitsu, they got a little bit better with the copiers until they eventually knocked Xerox off of its perch. But they did it from coming at the low end, going to small businesses that previously not owned a copier, and going that way. So the economic growth potential of sustaining innovations is moderate or incremental. Uh, basically, right, what is going to be the impact on air travel, the air traffic business when the Dreamliner comes along? Probably not that much, right? I mean, it's good for Boeing, no doubt. Uh, although they probably would have sold a different Boeing plane instead. They can sell for a little bit higher premium. And, you know, airlines will be a little bit more profitable because they can send more passengers longer with less fuel. But it's not going to suddenly lead to this whole new group of people flying in airplanes. It's just going to make it the whole system work better than it does today. The impact of, uh, of uh, regulatory fiat is moderate or negative impact. Corn-based ethanol. Corn-based ethanol is good for corn farmers, right? The government is making uh, oil companies and gas stations put in fuel made out of corn. Uh, the problem is it makes food more expensive. Another problem is it makes gasoline more expensive, not work as well, and it's not particularly cleaner. So uh, the people that win are corn farmers, and the rest of us pretty much lose. Uh, but it's probably a wash, maybe a little bit of a negative. Uh, smoke alarms. How many of you all have the most awesome smoke alarm that money can buy? Yeah. Now you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you buy a 15 bucks smoke alarm because you've got to have one in the story, right? So that, I mean, that's, what it, that's what it means. Basically, if you're made to buy a product, you kind of do as little as required to meet what's required. You kind of otherwise adjust all your processes to work around it. Disruptive innovations. By the way, regulatory fiat, it tends to be oversold on the negative side. They go, oh, this is going to wreck the economy. Now, companies pretty much, in the same way that doesn't do a lot for the economy, companies tend to work around their processes to accommodate the requirement. Disruptive innovations, that's where you get the big growth, the new markets, right? So that's, you know, you look at the transistor radio. Right? What did that do? It, it led to an explosion of sales of radio. It, it enabled an explosion of sales of, of popular music because uh, that then meant the kids got exposed to more music and they, and they could buy not only radios, but records and things like that. So sustaining innovations are, they're deployed within the existing market and delivery structure. Uh, the customers are uh, the most demanding customers in the industry. This is a big one, right? So in other words, who's buying the uh, Boeing 787? I mean, it's the airlines, right? It's not like a startup, uh, you know, like cheapo.com airline, which is trying to get you there alive for 30 bucks, you know. They're, they're uh, it's, you know, it's the guys, that, the companies that, that uh, are the premium operators that have the international routes and things like that. Uh, so what they'll pay for, they're going to pay for improvements to incumbent systems along metrics that they value. Now, this is a little bit interesting, though, because so an, an example is software upgrades. So, you know, if you are a power user of Excel, you have to run really uh, big spreadsheets and do, you know, pivot tables and things like that. Uh, you might want to get uh, Office 2011 when you had Office 2010 and when you had Office 2008 uh, because you need the best and baddest spreadsheet software there is, and you'll pay for it. Uh, another example is, uh, but here's another example of a, of, of a metric that demanding customers value, ethical. This is not a huge part of the market, but nor is it a huge part of the market for people who need the biggest and baddest spreadsheet program. In other words, you've got a tier of customers in every existing market who want to pay for something that they care about in which the incumbent solutions don't do a good job of providing. Ethical means things like Whole Foods, uh, in Trader Vic's, you know, they, they sell a lot of organic products. People are buying these things for ethical reasons. Why do people who have PhDs or make $300,000 a year buy a Prius when they could buy an Escalade? Because they're dissatisfied with the environmental performance of a car, and they'll pay a premium for a smaller car because it meets their ethical concerns. So winning companies, 
who are the winning companies when a startup goes toe to toe with an existing incumbent company sustaining innovation? The startup or the incumbent? It turns out that 99.99% of the time it's the incumbents. Uh, and there's, there's a reason why. It doesn't mean that startups don't have a role in this, but if you have a startup that has a great new technology, it turns out that the best thing you can do is sell out as fast as possible to an incumbent. Because if you're Cisco or Exxon or IBM, you say, there's two ways that I could deal with this startup that's got a better technology than mine. One of which is, it's the easy way, I can buy them out. The hard way is I can squash them like a bug. I can you know, pay for an army of engineers. I can get all my existing customers and cut them deals, but I'm going to win. Yeah, I've got the might, I've got the power, I've got the money, I'm going to win. That's the way the real world works. That's why if Cheapo Express tried to come in against United Airlines, uh, you know, United would probably beat them every time, except maybe on little routes, uh, which would be disruptive innovation. So in other words, the incumbents win. So here's an example of something called uh, cramming. Cramming is when you deploy a new technology into an incumbent model. By the way, an example of a sustaining innovation and what all of us do is smart meters. Right? It's not that a utility has never used an electric meter before. It's that when they get their new meter, they're going to get a smart meter so that they could do things more efficiently than they did before. So, so uh, a smart meter is one of those things that's an example of a sustaining innovation. So cramming, you deploy new technology into an incumbent model even though it doesn't work very well. It's kind of like when the TV companies tried to put uh, transistors into the early TVs and it turned out that the transistors couldn't provide the power uh, to show the pictures on the big screens in the same way that vacuum tubes could. These are underpowered little devices. They tried and they actually failed. Uh, so they, didn't, they weren't oblivious to the value of it. They just couldn't get it done. So uh, the impact of a sustaining innovation that's cramming is it's not disruptive. The new technology features as, features a liability, as in the case of the transistor being used in the early TVs. Um, here's a big one. So uh, Clayton Christensen at Harvard Business School wrote uh, in 2004 that you have a good sign that a is being crammed into products or new technologies when companies try to convince customers to change their behavior or to put up with something that they don't seem to want. And what we all do in Smart Grid, we're hearing a lot of products that are saying, hey, we're going to make people get excited about managing energy. And we're going to change their behavior by giving them in, uh, information that can change their behavior. There, there's a lot of information that suggests that well, it's not irrelevant to people. They just don't care that much. Why don't they care that much? Because you guys are doing such a good job at providing reliable electricity at affordable price. Why do they need to become experts on arbitraging electricity if they flip a switch and the lights come on and they hit the thermostat and the electricity comes on? So if things are working well, why are you going to try to change my behavior and make me care about something I don't currently care about? I'm going to say, by the way, I'm convinced, for a variety of reasons, the smart grid has enormous economic potential. But, but this is an example of the wrong way to go about doing it if we're trying to create economic opportunity at the same time. So regulatory fiat, regulation, legislation, customers, they're the subject of the government mandate. Will they pay for what's required to comply? Um, disruptive innovation, they're deployed on a new platform in a new location or context of consumption, just like the transistor radios, right? Uh, new customers listen to music in a new place. Uh, so the customers are people whose needs were not well met by the incumbent offerings. The kids who wanted to listen to Elvis Presley and had to do it in front of their parents until they got a different option. So, the, so set-top radios that were really expensive that they, they had to listen to in their parents' living room did not meet their needs to listen to their music that their parents didn't want them to hear. Uh, the requirements, so there are certain requirements of economic theory that tell you what has to happen before uh, disruptive innovation can happen. It has to solve an existing problem for customers. Not a new one that customers don't care about. Now, customers' problems change over time in response to, to events, but so that doesn't mean that problems are static. But they have to be existing at the time the product comes out. 
It has to be on a new platform, and there has to be a killer app. So what's the killer app of clean energy? Yeah, there's not one, right? It had happened. Yeah. By the way, the fact that none of us can identify a killer app in clean energy tells us that the preconditions for disruptive innovation have yet to occur. Now it can happen, and we believe it will happen to the right, the right strategies, but this is a warning sign to all of us. Look, I, my living is based on the success of happening, and I'm telling you it hadn't happened yet, and we all know it hadn't happened, but there's a pathway to get there. It just hadn't happened yet. So the winning companies, 99.99% of the time, when a startup goes up against an incumbent, the startup wins. Sony was once a startup, right? And then they come along with transistor-based devices, and they beat the big guys in TV, killed them, knocked them out of business. So disruptive innovation, the platform characteristics, has to be built on another multiple platforms. So take these things, right? Yeah, I get out of my pocket. <laughs> uh, so if you have an app on one of these phones, uh, let's say something like Yelp or Around Me, these are apps that help you find a restaurant. To do that, it accesses one platform called GPS. And to tell, say, where you are. And then it does another platform called the Internet to pull in information about restaurants that are, have addresses near where you are and restaurant reviews. And then it delivers that to you over a third platform, which is the transistor, which is the microprocessor in a phone. And it delivers it wirelessly using a fourth platform called the mobile broadband network, or telecom. These, none of these things were in combination until these things came along. You could not find a restaurant when you went on vacation by pulling out your phone or doing any kind of location service until all those platforms were combined into one. This, people used to think these were about phone calls, right? But we, you know, we added in a lot of services now. And so now, you know, uh, we can find our way around in restaurants and things like that. So that means the platform, you know, GPS, broadband, transistor, internet, to do a lot of different things. There's an app for that, right? The new platform has to be built on multiple platforms and capable of more than one use. So when we say that smart grid is going to be about energy improvements, that's a warning sign that it better be integrating into these other platforms to add in new uses and capabilities. If it's just a straight line and making energy more efficient, it's not going to create the big economic growth we're trying to achieve. Uh, it has to empower customers to do a job in a new context, like find restaurants when you're on vacation with an app or any of these apps. Um, plug and play with well-defined interfaces. Let's talk about the most successful disruptive platform in the history of mankind. You know what it is? The electric grid. Okay, around here right now, the uh, all of the in Austin and in all the cities that are older than 75 years, 100 years old, the fire stations are all real close together in the middle of the town. There's two reasons for that. You know what they are? One reason is is that the fire stations started getting built back before cars. So you had to have horse-drawn carriages to go fight a fire. So that was a little bit slow. They need to be closer. And there's a second reason why there's a lot of fire stations concentrated, because cities used to burn down all the time. <laughs> you know why? Because people wanted light. And what was the only option to get light? Have open flames inside of your house. When the light bulb came along, you could take a light bulb from any company and take it anywhere and screw it into the ceiling and light with no fire. And not only that, but this platform is so great that it meant also that you could plug a washing machine in and suddenly people who used to spend a day or two a week cleaning clothes threw it in a machine, walked away, and it was done in two hours. Changed people's lives. Cooking, you know, cleaning, uh, light, comfort, refrigeration of food. The electric grid was a plug-and-play platform. You got a device that could plug in, and it would do a job for you better than any of your choices were before. It was a marvel. So when we talk about the options on smart grid, there is a high bar to meet for what the original electric grid has achieved in terms of transforming people's lives. The other example is USB pl pl you know, plugs. You can plug in any peripheral. That's another example of plug and play. 
So examples of successful disruptive pla innovations, micro, uh, the platforms, are, uh, Windows, Internet, electric grid. So let's talk about, we'll have two final slides here. Uh, one is, let's take an example of, of a modern disruptive innovation. It's the iPhone together with the App Store. So do you know what the iPhone is known as within the cellular phone industry? You know what its nickname is by its competitor companies? The Jesus Phone. Yeah. So uh, and that's, that is because of what a transformative product it has been uh, uh, in the cellular phone industry. So the iPhone and App Store have been disruptive to GPS services. Garmin, TomTom, Tom, dead. Who's going to buy that in five to ten years, right? If you have GPS on your phone, you use maps, you don't need to buy a standalone device to do GPS services. Calculator makers. I was at dinner with some folks. <laughs> yeah, I was at dinner with some folks on Monday night. And one of them said uh, that he had pulled out a calculator at home, and his seven-year-old kid is started laughing at him. He said, what is that? <laughs> it's a calculator. He said, why don't you have one in your phone? Well, <laughs> Yeah, calculator makers hear that story and they weep. <laughs> map makers, remember those orange key map guides and things like that? Remember having to pull up maps in your car and you don't have to do that anymore? Uh, camera companies, most point and shoot cameras are now delivered uh, as an app, essentially, and, and it embedded into a smartphone. Stopwatch makers, CD and DVD manufacturers, all, almost all music is now listened to through wireless download. Uh, software is now done through wireless download. You don't need to buy a physical device that much anymore. And we're getting to the point where you won't need to buy it at all. So and that started when this made it possible to download music and software uh, wirelessly. Video camera companies. Most people's video camera is not a standalone $800 device. It's, uh, it's something on your smartphone. Compass makers, large software companies. It used to be that the only way you could buy software for video edit, uh, for a picture photo editing is you had to go to a, a software store, and there were three choices, and two of them were named Adobe, and that's because they had relationships. And now there are about 40 different photo editing softwares on Android Marketplace or, or the iPhone App Store where, that you can pay $2.99 for or $1.99 and edit photos. Phone. Phone companies, phone company, not disruptive to phone companies. iPhone, as disruptive as it's been, it has not been disruptive to phone companies. And in fact, it's been just a new, better smartphone. And the sure sign of that is, look at all the Android phones from Motorola, HTC, LG, Sony, Ericsson. In other words, they were able to build a more profitable new phone. All of this disruption has been great for the phone company. And this gets into something why smart grid is actually going to be really good for the electricity industry. And that is that any time a disruptive innovation emerges, the only way it succeeds is not by eating its young and killing the underlying platform. It relies on the underlying platform to be as good as possible. That's why the internet ditched the phone grid and went over to uh, broadband internet from cable companies. Uh, they need the underlying grid to be as good as possible. So smart grid investments are unlikely to produce economic improvement all by themselves. But, what they, but for disruptive innovations to emerge uh, that will be economically successful, it is absolutely be critical for this, these companies that the electric grid be as good as possible. And so there are two kinds of companies making a lot of money in this sorry economy we're in right now. One is companies like Apple and Google who are making these great platforms that are uh, changing the way that we can get around and are entertained and communicate. Uh, the second group of companies that are making record profits are AT&T and Verizon and Orange and Rogers and all these mobile carriers. In other words, the grid operators are getting rich also. So what this tells us is that when a disruptive new innovation occurs that is done right, the underlying platform owners also are successful. And that's a, that, I consider that very promising because we all have vested interest in the success of, of a stable, uh, well-performing electric grid. So let's move on to the, I'll show you the last diagram and then I'll get off. This is what we view as the platform 
for how all this is going to work. <laughs> Two things. One of which is the smart meter is not the portal in to manage your refrigerator. You guys don't want this. Customers don't want it. Imagine all the data you suddenly have to, you have to open up 15 data centers to get information on a refrigerator that, by the way, doesn't use that much energy. Yeah. And so, now there are sorts, a lot of value that can come from a platform like a home alarm system model where it can get information on energy and help manage electric cars and solar panels and storage and get apps. Uh, but it'll just share information probably on total home usage uh, with the meter between the home energy management platform and the meter. Uh, and so that tells us for starters that uh, um, let's talk about the, the value propositions on this because it, be, it has to be about more than energy management. People don't care. They care a little bit, but they don't care a lot, right? And, uh, and so, for instance, if you have something like this and you get a report that your gas has been running for six straight hours, that tells you what your gas bill is going to be. It also tells you you have a gas leak, right? And if you uh, have high school age kids and you go out of town for the weekend and you get a report on your phone that your toilet is flushed 40 times in the last 45 minutes, <laughs> it tells you what your water bill is. It also tells you your miserable, no good, ungrateful children are having a party at your house, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's parenting, it's security. So, uh, and finally, if you have something like this and you have a grandparent or a parent who wants to live at home uh, and you've got a system that says how often the oven's being used and when the water's being turned on, the toilet's being flushed, the refrigerator's being opened, I mean, that helps to tell you what your mom's or your grandparents' uh, energy usage is. It also is a signal that things are okay. This becomes a way to age in place with software instead of video people staring at you. So that's an example of energy data can provide some home health care options or home security options. So let's think of these things as, uh, as being able to manage energy, but also to do, solve more problems for us in our lives. And, and a system that makes that possible will be profitable and good for the electricity operator. Uh, and it will enable a lot of things like electric cars and solar panels. I'll tell you one quick final takeaway we're getting from our research, which has been a big surprise for us is that solar panels are producing a lot more electricity for people that have them on the rooftops than we expected. In August, of, of this, this past August, the hottest recorded month in, the history, in Texas in the history of the United States, people had solar panels on their roofs in our research groups. Uh, they weren't actually turning their ACs down very much, which means they're sane, right? Because it was hot out there. Right? But, uh, when they had solar panels, during peak demand hours, 3 to 7 p.m., their rooftop solar panels were producing between 70 and 117 percent of their total peak energy demand during peak periods. Astounding, right? So what this tells us is, is that if we got more efficient on the way things got managed within the home, we could have the same level of comfort, and we could use that solar to do things like charge cars. That's what we're working on Pecan Street. That's what Barry's helping us out on with. That's what y'all are a team member of working on with this. So I'm really happy to be here with you, and, and thanks for hearing me out.